It was about 1996 that actually we started the work of working with people, in, first in the States in prison. So what happened was I was editing, I think it showed it in the film actually, I was editing Mandala, which is the magazine of the FPMT, this organisation of my lamas, and we got a letter, I think we mentioned this, we got a letter from this young Mexican-American ex-gangster in Los Angeles, from, who'd been from, who was from Los Angeles, and it grew from there, you know, he wrote and he was interested in Buddhism and we sent a book and then within a year I had 40 people writing to us. And one of those people was Ralph, who was in the film, we spent some time in the film with Ralph. Or Ralph somehow through a friend got in touch with us and I went, and I, because I was teaching on the East Coast that particular year, I think 97, I visited Ralph and that was the first year I met Ralph and then I met both also the others, the guys on Death Row for example, the guys in red in the movie. And and uh, and I used to go every year visiting Ralph, who's on the who was in the general population, and then the guys on death row, who were in, who were the red ones. So I would visit and teach in the in the chapel. Um, so since then, that was 97, 98, 99. So since then, it, the prison project continued to grow. Um, we would continue to receive letters. I was based in Santa Cruz with Mandela, um, which was near Santa Cruz. International Office, the FPMT International Office, and we would continue to receive letters. I would receive letters. This is while I was still working for the magazine. And then by, I think by, by 2000, more and more people were writing. And the, and the main program we had was um, receiving letters from prisoners. There were many people to, to visit, in, you know, many prisons all over the country. Because, as we know, I mean, I've read recently now, in 2013, I've read recently that uh, the United States has 5% of the world population, but it has 25% of all the prison population on earth. A quarter of all human beings on earth in prison live in the United States. So it's quite intense. So at some point we were receiving more and more letters, you know, and by 2001 I, I decided I needed to start paying salaries to people to continue the work. It was impossible to deal with it myself. And we grew from there. And then in 2001, after this film actually was made, and, and um, it was Amiel, my nephew, who made it, the director, he was nominated as, as Best Documentary Director at the AFI Awards in Australia in 2000. And so that year and after that, I, I travelled around Australia teaching and uh, would then visit prisons in most of the states in Australia. And from there, we also started the prison project in Australia. Yes, I still have contact with the prisoners, but I no longer run the prison project. I was the executive director. Um, well, I be, I, it, the work began in '96 with this letter from Arturo, and then we became a non-profit in 2001 in the States. We became, you know, legally, we got legal status in Australia soon after that. And then I continued to run it, um, I think, until 2009. And it grew, it really grew enormously because the need was enormous. We, we you know, the main, I can't think of, the main program we decided we would have was to receive, to, to answer letters from prisoners. Because, I mean, as I mentioned before, the states, there's so many people in prison and the country's so huge, it's impossible to visit every prisoner. It's, it's you know, it's impossible. And anyway, the problem is you visit a prison, you, you give a teaching to a certain group, and certainly say in prisons like California, where the movement of the prisons is so intense, within a month they're all gone to different prisons. And you, it's, so it's really quite difficult. And what I realised was that the need was so huge, we would receive letters. And so I made a, we, we decided that that was our main program. We, would, we, we eventually, by the time I left, we had a team worldwide of at least 200 mentors, many, many countries, individuals, Buddhists, and then we would have a system where we assigned a mentor to prisoners. Who said, "I have a friend," was the most precious gift, precious gift you could offer. You know, many didn't actually become serious Buddhists, but indeed many did, and some are most marvelous practitioners. But that was the most precious gift we could give, having personal contact. And then, of course, we would provide books. We would take their phone calls. So at a peak, I think we were. I was raising forty thousand dollars a month. I was paying salaries to nine full-time workers, both Australia and the states. If I were helping the people in prison politically, I would be involved in lessening their physical suffering, on changing the rules, on trying to get them to get, have, have, you know, to get uh, to help their sentencing. I made a very conscious decision. There was no way I could possibly go there. It would be an, a total nightmare dealing with the bureaucracy of prisons and trying to help in this way, because you've got to focus your energy on certain things. And I could see really clearly, very clearly, that the way I wanted to help people in prison was use, giving them the tools to help them deal with their lives. That, for me, was the most precious gift. I could, you know, the the amount of energy we did. To, 
with the amount of energy we put in, that I put in for those 14, 15 years I was doing it, into just doing that was already stupendous because the bureaucracy is so immense, the obstacles are so enormous, and I would suggest that the, the prisoners don't have any merit, the way they say in Buddhism, so to help them, we had to do 10 times more work than helping people on the outside with Dharma. We, our, the tools we gave them were spiritual tools. I made a conscious decision that the way to really benefit was to give them spiritual tools, which means mental tools, which means tools to help them deal with their garbage dump lives so that they can help each other. It seemed when we work politically that you're helping lots of people. And then I look at the work we were doing in prisons, it seems like you're helping people one-on-one. -on -one. What good is that, you'd think? You're helping one prisoner. But then when I analyse it, OK, what we, we're giving this one prisoner a book, for example, a book that talks about how he can change his mind, talks about how he can understand, use, okay, using Buddhist tools, but understand his own mind, which is really the point of being a Buddhist. That one book, because these guys in these prisons have nothing and no money. So one book, as they told me, a hundred people would read that one book. As one guy said, one of my friends in, uh, in, um, in Michigan, who was you know, ex-gangster, Puerto Rican, he said, Rabina, my copy of Lama Yeshi is worn thin. One small 30-page book, written, you know, read, read by so many people because they have nothing. So that means a hundred different people reading one book and then they would tell a friend and then they would tell their mother and they would tell their sister. So one tiny book that we might have sent, which we would have sitting on our shelf not bothering to read it because we feel we have so many books, but they have nothing, you know. So that can be affecting the lives of countless people. So if I think about it over those years, um, we probably, I don't know, 50,000 books, 500,000 books, I've lost count, I really haven't, I forget the numbers. We spent, we sent thousands of books. We probably had letters from 25 to 30,000 prisons just in the period that I was there. So if every one of those guys got two, three, five, ten, twenty books and they shared them with so many people, we probably helped millions of people. And even if they read the words, you can change your mind, you can learn to deal with your reality. This for me is the most precious gift to give somebody. So I think of Mitch on death row in Kentucky. He's living in his home there with the last 30 years with these other 40 men on death row in Kentucky. That's where he lives. They're his friends. They're his family. He goes jogging with these guys every day in, in their little block, you know. They support each other. They like each other. They, they're friends to each other. He probably has helped so many people. I mean, people talk about helping people in prison so that when they get out into the world, they can be better. And so, but as far as I'm concerned, they're all human. They're all living. They're all part of our society, even if they're living on death row. That's society. So by helping one person with his own mind, he can help 20 other people. The psychos, he would never write to us, but he's helping them as well. How amazing. What a way to help people touch the hearts and minds of human beings for me is whereas politically of course we can do things like that of course we could but you have to you have to make a decision what you're going to do so if helping people's minds is not political work I don't know what political means look at the meaning of the word politics it's to do with the people isn't it the root of it so I'm a political activist definitely Uh, yes, I'm still teaching, yes, I am. <laughs> Since, I mean, Lama Zoparamache asked me in 87 actually to start teaching. For, before that, for 10 years, I'd been involved with Wisdom Publications editorially and uh, doing editorial and production work. And then Rinpoche asked me to teach. So in 87, I've been doing that. And now, because I'm no longer running the prison project, I'm teaching full time, traveling around to about 40, 50 centers a year, Lama Zoparamache centers, bringing my Lama's teachings to his centers worldwide, Europe. States, South America, Australia. I go to the centres of FPMT right. in Europe. For example, I go to the centres in London, uh, the centres in England, one in London, France, and then I went to the States, the Northern Amer North America, spent six months there. So centres on the East Coast and the West Coast of the States, so maybe 15 centres in the States, and then two centres in Canada, a uh, centre in Colombia, and one in, one in Argentina. And then now I'm in Australia. So here, centres here on the East Coast, in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, Western Australia. I do a little circuit. I'm homeless now, I have no home. I have one little bag, one set of robes, a couple of pairs of shoes. No, I'm in a Melda Marcos of shoes, I've got three pairs of shoes. And uh, it suits my nature. An old hippie traveling around, that's it. That's what I do now. Okay. So yes, I went through these various phases in my life. In my pursuit, I would say, yeah, I began being a Catholic brought up a Catholic and then I was sort of a hippie and then I was into radical left politics and then feminist politics and now a Buddhist. So I, I mean on the face of it they're different labels, on the face of it different ways of thinking but I think in my life although I was driven more than anything, driven driven by the wish to find a view, a world view, driven by 
the wish to understand why the world is the way it is, you know. So, and also I wanted freedom more than anything. I wanted freedom. So, it seems to me I am all those things. How can, it, how can I not be? It's all part of who I am, you know. But the label, of course, the label you use for me now is Buddhist nun.